Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Otto Lee. I'm very uh, glad to be able to assemble a really amazing group of uh, panelists tonight to talk about a very important issue on affirmative action, which is also going to be on a ballot this year in the California election on November 3rd as Proposition 16. Uh, and uh, before I start, let me just do a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Otto Lee. I was myself born in Hong Kong when I was 15 years old, uh, moved to California, actually our family moved to Berkeley uh, and went to uh, UC Berkeley High and UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, actually my day job is I'm a patent attorney here, uh, practicing law for the last uh, 20 odd years. Uh, I also served uh, 20, a uh, few years ago, I was served uh, on the US Navy. Uh, I went to Navy ROTC through UC Berkeley, served 28 years and actually retired as a Navy commander in logistics. Uh, also, uh, um, on the Sunnyvale is where I live. If you could see the background here, Murphy Avenue, which is where I have spent my last 25 years. I also served in the Sunnyvale City Council uh, as a councilman and, uh, and the mayor uh, back in 2006. And uh, so this, I would like to also give a very quick uh, brief introduction to the wonderful panelists we have been able to assemble today. Uh, we have uh, Nikki gonzalez Yun. A, a political science professor here at De Anza College. Uh, we have Mary Celestin, founder of San Jose Strong. We have Alexis Zaragoza, uh, who is serving on the UC Board of Regents as a member for 2020 and the 2022 term. And we also have Hiwat Haider, the campaign organizer and the DNC delegate for California Congressional District 18. And thank you very much for all of your attendance today. Um, today, we have our facil facilitator, uh, Lawrence Su, who he will first go over the schedule uh, and some reminders and the community agreements for the uh, Zoom event. Go ahead, Lawrence. All right, thank you so much, Otto. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and presentation here today. So our schedule, we just went through a Quick introduction, took us about five minutes or so. We're then gonna talk about our community agreements, some goals of this presentation. Then we're gonna move on to panel questions, later audience questions, and then wrap it up with some next steps and closing from auto. So some reminders just wanna to give to folks is, remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking so that we can prevent any background noise. And what's gonna happen is that for our audience, go ahead and type out your questions under the Q&A section where Elika, uh, one of our also other facilitators will be looking at your questions and presenting those questions uh, during audience questions for the panel to answer. Some community agreements. So we kind of got came up with five main community agreements that we like to ask for all the panelists and the audience to abide by is we want to make sure we use inclusive and respectful language. We want to make sure you use I statements that we talk about ourselves, not necessarily talking about you know general broad statements for other folks. Uh, personal opinions are okay. Uh, we want to hear about your story, and we also want to hear about your questions for our audience. Remember to challenge really the idea or the belief and not the person. Uh, it's, it's okay to have different ideas, uh, but we want to, you know, maybe step a little bit away from in terms of targeting a person in terms of their character. And also remember that when one person is speaking, we have the one mic rule as well. When one person is speaking, let them finish, and we'll move on to the next one. And last but not least, Let's also be aware of time. For our responses, we'll be keeping it around two to four minutes, so to speak. Uh, and it's just to make sure that we move through this event uh, swiftly and on time. The main goals that we're gonna have here today is number one, we're gonna have an informed conversation about Prop 16. We're gonna be answering as many questions as we can, sharing the stories that we have. Uh, but most of all, if we could also correct any maybe misconceptions that we might have on affirmative action as it relates to Proposition 16. Then with that knowledge that we've gained, we're gonna transform that into action. Uh, and we'll talk more about it near the end of the presentation. All right, I'm gonna turn it back to Otto. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for, uh, uh, for the good introduction on these rules. And I would like to also introduce uh, our first uh, panel starter uh, question uh, from Kelsey Main from uh, Santa Clara of your questions. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my question is from your perspective, what does affirmative action do or has done for you? Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Kelsey for the question. And we would like to go ahead and ask uh, Professor Nikki uh, Gonzalez Yun to get started. Hi, so let me just say a word about who I am so you understand my background a bit and then I'm happy to respond to the question. Um, so my name is Nikki Gonzalez Yuan. I'm an instructor at De Anza College. Uh, I'm the chair of the political science department. And I'm also an elected official in the East Bay where I serve on the Peralta Community College Board. I've really spent my life doing community college work. Um, and to respond to the, the question, um, you know, how, how have I been positively affected by affirmative action? Um, I approach this from a, a philosophical perspective that, that, that says something like, we all do better when we all do better. And, and what I mean by that is, um, is this, I, I, my early childhood was in New Orleans, deep south, in a segregated deep south. Um, my family was excluded from just the normal participation of everyday experiences, and uh, it was a changing era. My brothers and I were the first non-white kids to desegregate schools in our neighborhood. And I experienced complete ostracism, people spitting on me, uh, you know, treating me like I was less than. Uh, my family moved to Southern California and uh, it was a really explosive era of, of liberation and growth in our society. So my family moved in 1968 to Southern California where I really began experiencing something very different and, and the beginning of some opportunities. Um, now, you know, we, we had some opportunities to really do well. And uh, as an immigrant family, we worked really hard, but we had opportunities. Doors were open to us. And so, you know, I got a full ride to go to college. I, I got to go to uh, University of California um, as a law student and as a graduate student. Um, now, I, I did really well. I worked really hard. But I'll tell you, my very first professional job was at De Anza College. My first real serious professional job was at De Anza College. They hired me under an affirmative action program. Prior to my coming to De Anza College, the political science department had never had a person of color, ever, as a faculty member. I mean, ever. It took them an affirmative action program to let me in. Now. Who did they let in? They let in somebody who was a PhD, JD from UC Berkeley, summa cum laude, top of the class, you know, not top, well, top of my high school class, but it took affirmative action to let me in the damn door. First one. Okay. I'm a community college teacher, and what I see is an extraordinarily talented group of people in our society, and we give people opportunity. And out of that opportunity, we get incredible payback in the society. But imagine that we just didn't allow people to succeed. Well, that's what we're doing right now. We're keeping out whole classes of people based on race and gender. We pretend like it's the opposite, but it's not the case at all. And so as a society, not only are we not living up to our highest ideals of justice and opportunity, we are robbing ourselves from talent if we can bring back affirmative action, we can be thinking carefully, how do we invest in every person? We come back to this idea that we all do better when we all do better. If there are not spaces in UC Berkeley to let somebody in, well, let's build some more universities. We'll do better if we do that. Anyway, I'm gonna stop talking, but that's my introduction. If, I, if, I, if there had not been affirmative action, I wouldn't have been hired at the ANZA. They would have done the same thing they'd been doing for all the years before I got there. There was nothing so, so special about me. But I think I've done pretty well for my students. Okay, I'm gonna go, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor and uh, Nikki. Uh, next, we have uh, Mary Celestin, um, go ahead. Hi, yes, um, to build off of, I, I don't know what I should call you, like a Professor Gonzalez. I'm a, <laughs> um, so Nikki's just fine. <laughs> um, to build off of uh, Nikki's commentary, um, first thing to mention about myself is that I'm a rising senior 
engineering major at Harvey Mudd College. For those who don't know Harvey Mudd, Harvey Mudd is part of the Claremont Consortium, um, which consists of Pomona College, Pitzer, Scripps, Claremont McKenna, and Harvey Mudd. And, um, you know, as an engineering major and as somebody in STEM, something that I've always thought about um, in regards to diversity of students and diversity of faculty and diversity of ideas of thought is that that's really the way that you get the most comprehensive and complete solutions to a problem, right? So if you're thinking about the scientific method, it starts with an assumption, but that assumption starts with the type of question you want to ask for what you want to solve. So it makes sense intuitively to me that you want to have as many diverse opinions and thoughts to approach a problem from as many different perspectives as possible to then have the most com complete and comprehensive solutions. And so um, an example that builds off of, of this conversation about higher education um, in regards to affirmative action, you know, Harvey Mudd was founded in the, I think it's 1955, I think is when Harvey Mudd was founded, um, primarily very uh, white, very elite, um, very male dominated STEM school. Um, and then roughly a decade or so ago, they uh, really started a push for uh, being way more inclusive. My class is 52% um, female, which is pretty unheard of for a school that only offers STEM majors. Like you can only major in the STEM field at, at my college. And um, there was a very interesting aspect that, that went down, which was a, a wall, the, it's called the Wallbash Report, um, essentially just studying the mental health at Harvey Mudd, which is not <laughs> good at times. Um, and one of the things they noticed was a lot of the professors saying that the quality of students had gone down since the university had pushed for being more inclusive of, of students um, from all different backgrounds and not just this one sliver of students um, in America and internationally, right? So um, all these professors said, oh, of course, the, like, the quality has gone down. These students aren't working hard enough. They're not learning the same. And to me, it made sense that these professors had these reactions, these older tenured professors, because I'm like, okay, you've been teaching carbon copies of yourself for 30 years. Uh, of course, students who learn differently or come from different backgrounds, the same curriculum isn't gonna isn't gonna cut it the same way. Um, and it's not really a question of the students not being equipped or ready to handle it. It's really a question about how well you can teach to a wide variety of students and the limits of your perspective in this conversation. And so I definitely see that just my experience in Harvey Mudd College being a testament to to the benefits of affirmative action in an environment that, while it has a long ways to go in terms of progressive um, progressive agendas, like my experience with with my classmates, my friend group is just such an eclectic group of students from all different backgrounds, from all different perspectives, and we come together on engineering teams and are able to solve really unique and interesting um, questions and solutions and. Yeah, so I, I really think I have, I have more I have more thoughts, but I definitely don't want to hold this conversation for too long. And so I'm happy to pass 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 it on. Um, yes, I will pause there. Hey, thank you very much, Mary, for your uh, wonderful perspective. Uh, next, we have Alexis Zaragoza. Alexis, you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, so, well, first, I want to say thank you for having me, um, and also that. Um, well, I am here because of my role on the UC Board of Regents, and that position gives me very powerful insight. I do not speak on their behalf. Um, however, I am very happy to say that my board has formally taken up support of Prop 16, and I'm very proud of that. So I'm not going to be too far off. Most likely. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? That was a unanimous vote of the Regents. Isn't unanimous, it? yes. So, um, and that's incredible. And that was before I was there. So. I'm proud. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, so as for me, uh, my name is Alexis Matsiliski. Um, Zaragoza actually is also my uh, Cherokee first name. Um, and so half of my family, just in terms of my family history, um, half of my family comes from Michoacan. Uh, and my dad immigrated here when he was 12 years old. 
uh, with some of his family. Um, my other half, uh, my mother is Cherokee. Um, we are also ha are descendants from the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and Choctaw Nation. Um, and so that's just a little bit of that background. Um, but also, of course, another group that affirmative action helps. Uh, I am a woman, <laughs> especially uh, a woman working in politics, which I can tell you has led to um, quite a bit of harassment in that world. Um, and so I, I feel like I do have um, a lot to say about Prop 16, which is why I've been very vocal and very active about it. Um, so I, you know, I came from a low income background. My mother luckily went to a local college. Uh, so I was not a first generation. Um, however, my dad was never able to get through school um, and has been trying to go back for years, but it's obviously really difficult. Um, you know, but my family has always been, you know, working in the fields. My brother's doing that right now at 16. Um, we're from the Central Valley. And so, you know, we don't come from like this higher off background, like some people in the UCs or maybe a lot of people in the UCs do. Um, you know, I, I also, you know, when I went to school, um, I was going to a really under-resourced high school, which led to me not finishing my A through G requirements. And I ended up uh, getting accepted to Humboldt only to have it revoked <laughs> uh, because I didn't finish a math class because there was no available tutoring, that kind of thing at my school. Um, which is why I'm also a huge advocate for understanding that not all students come from the same background and not all of us have the same opportunities as others. Um, and so, you know, that really pushed me into advocacy when I came into college. I went to a community college first, uh, Modesto Junior College. And there is where I had joined student government because I noticed that, you know, a lot of students were were taking a really long time. I didn't understand why. Um, and so I really got into the advocacy there ended up being uh, one of the um, one of five uh, Latinas who were the first ever all Latina executive student government board in the state of California, which was a really random niche cool thing. Uh, and so, you know, from there, I ended up joining the California Community Colleges Board of Governors representing uh, 2.12, I think now it could be up to 2.3, I'm not sure yet. Uh, uh, community college students in the state of California. And of course, during that time, there was a lot of advocacy work there um, and ended up transferring to UC Berkeley, where okay. I spent a year, yes, go Bears. <laughs> um, ended up spending a year on the Board of Admissions for the UC system, which was a huge honor, um, and eventually transitioning into being uh, the next UC student regent. Um, and, you know, one thing that I can say from all that experience that I've seen, you know, I have always been a part of the group of people that has been trying to push for equity, um, academically, equity within higher education. And I can say that there is a lot being done and there has also been a lot done being done in admissions, right? I worked there for a year for the UCs. Um, and so within the UC system, I mean, I remember, you know, I can't say what college, but one of the colleges uh, within the UC system gave us a presentation and they were talking about, you know, this is how we see a student uh, when we get their application. This is exactly the format. This is what you look at. And this student was perfect on paper, like absolutely perfect. They were in student government. They were in all these different things. They had perfect grades, a four point, like four, nine or something. Took a bunch of AP classes, all these incredible things. And at the end even had this incredible story to tell, right? It wasn't just a student who was really privileged. Um, and at the end of that presentation, uh, they asked us, you know, what would you do with the student? And we were all like, oh, they're in immediately, just right away. And then they, <laughs> the people who were actually on admissions at that school uh, had said, well, they might go in the maybe pile. <laughs> and that's an idea of how selective the UCs can be. Um, but one huge concept, misconception that I, I do want to really hit hard is that this idea that we're letting people in who may not be as good as others based on just race, right? Like, oh, you're only letting in the student because of race. Um, but that is absolutely not true. You know, there are so many students, there are thousands of students who don't get into a UC every year and they have almost the exact same things on paper. Um, all this is doing is asking to be able to look at race and you know, gender and trying to understand more about their story based on that. I also wanna say that you know, if this passes, that's not it. 
you know, we're not going to stop there. It just allows us to open more doors and be able to do more for admissions, to be able to, you know, help more people, do more things, create better regulations, um, and then continue on from there. And I can say that I cannot think of anything that will boost us higher in diversity than affirmative action will. And that's looking at the drops that happen right after. So, um, you know, diversity should not be optional. We need to get this passed so we can do better on that front. Um, but that is all I will say to that question. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alexis, for your, uh, your perspective. And I uh, jokingly want to mention that uh, when I was going to UC Berkeley, I remember every uh, semester I have to write a check to pay for my tuition. And I always write to this group called the UC Regions. So I said, hmm, when I grow up, I want to be one of those. <laughs> so I'm very honored to see that I'm speaking to a UC region here. And congratulations. It's, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun, it really is. All right. And next up, we also have uh, Hiwad, Haida. And uh, go ahead, Hiwad. Thank you so much, Otto. I wanted to echo the gratitude uh, for you and your team, Otto, for putting this event together. Um, I think it's critical for the folks who are on now. Thank you for tuning in at this time. Uh, it's a busy time. It's a tumultuous time for everybody. Um, and I think the subject of conversation today is so important to, you know, thinking about how students are going back to school as we speak. Uh, this is that first big week where we have middle school, high school, some undergraduates going back in that new updated fashion, Mary being one of them. Uh, to be able to talk about measures we can take. And uh, before I introduce my own capacities and the hats that I wear, uh, I think my preface would be emphasizing in, a, in the way that Alexis and our other panelists said, how critical it is that voters take a hard look at Prop 16 um, and take a hard look at the information that's being put out and taking a look at who the supporters and the opponents are and how those align with our values and the values we want to see in the community. Um, if there's one thing I can say about how affirmative action has impacted me directly, uh, I think Nikki has a very unique perspective having directly benefited in a way that at least the rest of our generation was not in a position to do, uh, but that Prop 16 will put our younger siblings and our kids and our grandkids in a position to benefit from, uh, is addressing the inequities that we don't see um, I'm a student at Santa Clara University, a rising junior there. I'm studying economics and history, uh, two, I think, intersectional subjects which touch upon what it means to have inequity, uh, what it means to have financial opportunities, what the legacy of policies that have existed, thinking about um, Jim Crow and thinking about redlining as uh, policy legacies in this country which have affected us throughout generations. Um, I also approach this subject from a profoundly electoral perspective. Uh, propositions and ballot measures are a campaign in the same way that Otto is running a campaign. Uh, there's two campaigns that I'm helping organize with right now. Uh, Jake Tonkel for City Council, Basil Saleh for Campbell Union High School District, and these are candidates who support Proposition 16. And if there's anything that any campaign has in common, uh, it's that you need to do outreach. You need to connect with people and find out what their concerns are, uh, what's important to them. Um, and I think what you see with affirmative action and how it relates to equity is this idea that uh, diversity is good for everybody. Nikki, I, I really appreciate the uh, slogan uh, approach to this. I had down something along the lines of, we're only as advanced as the least advantaged member in our society uh, in a similar way to what you said. Uh, I also take from someone who inspires me greatly, um, Senator Bernie Sanders, who always says, jobs and education over jails and incarceration, uh, thinking about the idea of the school to prison pipeline, which exists at high levels of education consistently. Uh, affirmative action has not affected my admissions, but I think about experiences that I've had, for example, last summer, working at the International uh, Rescue Committee in Oakland, uh, working with immigrants from um, Afghanistan, which is my uh, country of heritage, a uh, first generation Afghan American, uh, working with immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers from Ethiopia and Eritrea and Iraq and Syria, and thinking about the barriers that will exist as they try to enter 
uh, our society and do the things that we deem important, such as getting an education, getting a good job, raising a family, and doing so uh, in a way that's not harder for yourself than it is anybody else. Uh, so looking forward to the discussion and thank you again for having me. Well, thank you, Hiwat. Uh, the, thank you for your story and uh, the fact that you actually uh, came from Afghanistan, as you mentioned, uh, certainly it really uh, brings in the, uh, the dimension of our country has been in a war in Afghanistan now since, what, 2001, and then certainly has been uh, the longest war that we've ever fought and uh, very, very sad of your homeland, what it's going through. Um, and uh, I myself actually have served in Iraq as well, and certainly it's something I could talk a little bit more about uh, answering the question. Um, for me, I, I was uh, mentioned earlier, I was really born in Hong Kong uh, at the age of 15 uh, when, when the China decides to take back Hong Kong from the Brits. Uh, we were concerned of the communists uh, you know, taking away the freedoms of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And as we can see, this year it actually really happened uh, this July. Uh, and uh, you can see many of the pictures and protests in Hong Kong. Uh, after coming to, to the States, coming from a Catholic boys' school uh, in, in Hong Kong, I got to go to Berkeley High School, which is one of the most diverse uh, schools. And it's a really amazing experience for me to understands uh, what America is about, about the, not just the melting pot, but the, the diverse uh, ethnicity uh, and also culture uh, and the background of the students. Uh, when I went to Berkeley High School, I remember we have kids uh, from some of the brightest kids. Uh, you know, a lot of them are you know, kids from the pro professors that, go to UC, that teaches UC Berkeley and to some of the disadvantaged kids, you know, like say across the other side of the tracks, uh, African-American, Latinos, Asians, uh, we, have all, all, we have it all in Berkeley High. And then I actually, to be honest, I don't really appreciate how great the experience was until after I graduated from Berkeley High, how important that was for me as an immigrant. I'm a very uh, homogeneous kind of society in Hong Kong. Um, I went to UC Berkeley, uh, it was, um, uh, uh, through the uh, also the Navy ROTC program, I was participating, studying engineering. Um, we certainly have a lot of Asian students as well in class, uh, but also uh, noticing the, the the differences of what school is like going to Berkeley when it's uh, far for more competitive in terms of uh, academics, but the diversity is very much segregated in many ways by department of you know engineering or social science all that, and and. Through that, I went to Navy afterwards, uh, active duty a couple of years uh, in the East Coast as a supply officer uh, on board a cruiser, um, making payrolls for 450 uh, sailors and making sure uh, that we don't lose the money and all that. But then the great experience with leadership and then coming back up into UC Hastings uh, Law School in San Francisco. And there I was able to be accepted uh, through the LEA program called the Legal Education Opportunity Program, which basically is a affirmative action program through which I entered because of the fact that English was the second language to me. And even though I graduated from Berkeley, even though I served a couple of years in the Navy, I then realized I really couldn't write <laughs> until I get to law school. I was a horrible writer. You know, engineers usually are not great writers, and that certainly proved to be the, the case. And, and uh, so that was able to give me the opportunity to go to law school. And, but it's not just getting into the school, but it's also the extra uh, help and tutoring that we have uh, at Hastings, where we have special uh, classes for the LEOP students. Uh, in various areas to make sure that we're there. We, we started school a, a week earlier than everybody else uh, to, to learn the basics. And, and it's that extra help that we've been getting throughout the year that really helped all of us who went through the program to have a better chance to succeed. Certainly not everybody in the program started with me, was able to graduate from law school, but a, a far more majority of us were able to do so. And I think I, I attribute that success uh, to the LEA program when I was able to, you know, pass the bar the first time and then, you know, eventually practice law for the last call century and serve on the Sunnyvale uh, City Council as the first uh, Asian uh, on the Planning Commission, uh, one of the first two uh, Asian American ever elected to Sunnyvale City Council, which when you think about it, it's almost like, wait a minute, there's like 35, 40% Asians living in Sunnyvale. Uh, but it wasn't that long that ago that we actually have some representation. So we could see that the representation is something that is still lacking. As I mentioned probably earlier too, right now we have only one of seven of our council members in Sunnyvale is women. 
and and that's certainly something that that we have more to work on. And there's some very exciting women candidates running for council now. So I really do think that the, the need of affirmative action is very real, uh, and in so many. Uh, areas, what is higher education, what is elected office, because a lot of times we always say that if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And so the representation of folks from different ethnic background, different experiences, truly brings in the different perspective that's needed, especially in our very diverse community. And I think one thing so great about Silicon Valley, how successful companies are, and how so many countries around the world, how many cities around the U.S. wants to emulate Silicon Valley, one of the most important things we have, besides we have the great universities, uh, the, the venture capital, it really is the talent, the international and, and diverse talents that we have in Silicon Valley that brings in these different perspectives and skill sets and intelligence that makes us so successful, uh, which is very uh, unique in our, in our ways. So I think it's something that is so amazing that we have, which uh, is what makes the affirmative action to be so uh, most desirable. Um, now, um, before we go into the next uh, questions, uh, we are going to actually play a couple of videos. The uh, first video is actually uh, a pro uh, affirmative action, pro Prop 16's uh, 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 video. Um, and the second one actually is the anti-affirmative action. So are we all loaded up there? So go ahead and take it away. We came to America for a better life for our family and our children. The place where equal opportunity should be guaranteed for all. For Asians, the American dream has been elusive. Discrimination, anti-immigrant policies, and racial injustice are a part of America even today. The protests and civil unrest erupted throughout our country demonstrate clearly we still have a long way to go to achieve racial equality. That's why the Asian Pacific Islander Public Affairs Association supports ACA 5, the constitutional amendment which will restore fairness and equality for all Americans, particularly those who have struggled with the history of discrimination. This message is brought to you by the Asian Pacific Islander Public Affairs Association, or APAPA, founded by C.C. Yin, which help people of color succeed and fulfill their American dream. We stand with the thousands of organizations and individuals who are fighting for a more just and equal America. I am C.C. Yin, founder of APAPA, and I approve this message. We are all in this together. Because I have a dream. Yeah. My four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. And the chains of discrimination, 100 years later. We're going to be serious about race going forward to uphold laws against discrimination in hiring and in housing and in education and in the criminal justice system. That is what our Constitution and our highest ideals require. Well, people gathered at Fremont City Hall today to protest Proposition 16. That's a proposal on the November ballot designed to repeal Prop 209, which forbids the state from discrimination against or granting preferential treatment to people based on their race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin. And it applies specifically to areas of public employment, public contracting, public education. If there's any lesson that we can learn from the rest of the world, it is the fact that America's experiment with democracy will fail if we divide our people into racial enclaves and allocate jobs and contracts and college admissions on that basis.
Okay, thank you. And um, it's uh, both, I think, uh, uh, very powerful uh, messages being in, uh, said. And it was, as we could see, it was quoting Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and also President Barack Obama's uh, voices uh, was on the second video. As we know that Dr. King and uh, President Obama are both leaders of civil rights that supported affirmative action. Uh, and so it's very interesting how those words are being used. Now, what are some of the flaws with this type of messaging from the opponents? And what are the things that how we should, as pro affirmative action activists, be able to respond to educate uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, audience so that people truly understand what's going on here? Uh, I'm going to start the question again with uh, Professor Nikki Gonzalez Jun. I'm sorry, say the question again, just clarify oh, sure. it again. Right, so the question is that uh, this uh, argument that the uh, no on Proposition 16 has been making, that, well, this is actually, you know, illegal discrimination that, uh, that the affirmative action is going to be doing and, and hurting equality, uh, because now you're basically introducing these standards and discriminations instead of treating everybody equal. What would you say are the, the, your answer to those questions and how best to respond to these uh, arguments? There, there are two problems with the argument. Mm -hmm. First of all, whether we have Prop 209 or not, discrimination based on race and gender is illegal. Mm -hmm. And the repeal of Prop 209, the passage of Prop 216 isn't going to change that. Nobody's saying, oh, let's allow discrimination. So. That's the first part that's just incredibly misleading. The second part that's misleading is the thought that both before and since the ban on affirmative action, that we had something like equality in the society and something like equal opportunity. Look, when I went to law school at UC Berkeley, was uh, mid, in late 19, mid 1980s, when I got there, a third of the class were students of color. And that was only because we had affirmative action programs. But that same law school had a full-time faculty of 50 members, 50 full-time tenure track and tenured faculty. How many of them were not white and male? Two. Mm -hmm. So out of that full-time faculty, you just have this overwhelming point of view. Now, on the surface, you look and you go, okay, well, that's just discrimination, that's wrong. But there's actually even a more profound problem with that. It's that every single law student who was going through UC Berkeley at the time was getting a law school education that was framed by the concerns of a very privileged class of people. And so the concerns of everyday people were not being addressed. And I'll just give you one quick example of that. There was a woman named Marge Schultz who was an amazing contracts professor at Cal. And right before I got there, she had been denied tenure. She was an extraordinary scholar, did contracts law, but her special, special field was marriage and contracts law. And so that's what she did research and writing on. And when she submitted her kind of seminal tenure review piece that was on marriage and contracts law. And the chair of her tenure committee basically said, uh, the entire subject of marriage and contract just bores and irritates. Why would anybody pay attention to marriage and contract law? And this is coming from a guy whose fate is not critically dependent on the status of marriage. And if you're a woman in our society, like my mother, and you raise kids, and then you're spouse abandons you and leaves you in poverty, you understand the importance of a marriage contract. If you don't have to deal with that, you don't have to deal with that. And here's the problem with having a faculty that is so monolithically undiverse. The kind of education that people get just doesn't work for the actual society that we live in. There's, there, we need to be proactively thinking about discrimination and to just put blinders on and say, oh, look, if we don't pay attention, it'll all just go away is flawed thinking. 
So that, that's what's wrong with this argument. I could have been more concise, but I'm a college professor. God, sorry. <laughs> well, you're paid to speak, right? And lecture, so uh, definitely. Well, thank you, uh, Nikki, for that. Uh, let's see, Mary, um, are you ready? And uh, if you can unmute yourself, and I would love to hear your perspective of what you think would be the best response to uh, that type of argument. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, to, to continue and mimic and ex ex just continue off of what Nikki was saying. Um, the, the argument is suggesting that pushing forward Prop 16 would be creating a system and a structure in which students are discriminated against based on their race or their gender as if we don't exist in a current society that already does that and as if um, Prop 16 isn't working to create a more equitable system. And the question that I would ask would be, what does an ideal world look like in which we're in which, you know, that that statement that people can make decisions based on who they are, like just based on who they are and not being categorized based on their race or their gender, what would that look like? And I would be surprised to see um, anyone saying that it isn't an environment where people actually have all of those opportunities and have all of those resources. And that regardless of where you come from and your background, whether that's race, gender, socioeconomic status, like we can keep going down these lists that they have the same opportunity to explore higher education and to have access to this right to um, further their, their intellectual pursuits. And in order to do that, because we currently exist in a structure that is inherently and purposefully unequal, we need to actively work to create new structures that promote, um, promote such equity. And I think to expand on my personal, personal stories, um, you know, my top two schools that I was interested in were UC Berkeley and Harvey Mudd College were my top two. Um, and I got into both and like I got I got into to to all of the UCs um, and Harvey Mudd was my top choice, but it is the most expensive school in the country and um, I received the President Scholars Program, which is a full tuition scholarship program geared towards underrepresented students in STEM and you know, I mean, to, to mimic Nikki, like, you know, top of my class, I did exceptionally well um, in all of these different aspects of my high school career. Um, but it was having an opportunity like PSP that allowed me to attend um, this, this institution where like, uh, like otherwise I, I wouldn't have been able to go to Harvey Mudd because it was incredibly expensive. Um, and so I think that that's like an example of creating a pathway to leveling the playing field where other students could just pay 70K a year to go to an institution. Um, it's creating, creating tools for students of um, just, just to, to, to participate um, in the educational process um, and experience. I will pass the mic on or I will also continue to ramble. Uh, that's going to know. Thank you, Mary. That was a great story that uh, the the opportunity is not just getting to school, but of course, being able to afford to go to school because the real affordability issue is uh, one where uh, is forbidding a lot of people qualified to go that can afford to go, for example. Uh, how about Alexis? You want to mute your mic and share your uh, story and what do you think of uh, Beth's response to that? Yes. Um, so I think you know, the, the very thing that keeps that, that sticks with me um, about the video, um, the, the primary problem I see, especially is using Martin Luther King's words uh, to advocate for the maintenance of a society that continues to be unequal and discriminatory, not changing anything, keeping it as it is. Um, you know, I, I wonder 
how these people can look at what happened after we implemented Prop 209 and the extreme drops in all different races besides white, um, all of them, <laughs> and, and somehow think that, you know, stopping that and bringing it back to where we were before would be bad. Um, and, you know, just looking at using those sta that statement and using those words, um, the reason why it gets to me so much is obviously, you know, we continue to allow these institutional barriers we face to exist. And that is nothing that Martin Luther King would have ever advocated for. He wouldn't have advocated for keeping things the way that they are. Um, and it tells me that these people probably need to, meet, <laughs> to read a little bit more uh, from Martin Luther King than just that sole statement and uh, the single line that they've uh, clung to. Um, but this idea of thinking that we have to reject leveling the playing field. And um, you know, I think that is really an idea born out of this idea of colorblindness and that being better for us somehow, not acknowledging that race is a thing and you know that we are not all born equal and we are not all going to face the same things. And how can we continue to advocate for a society that does that to us um, and not fight for those people? Um, and so, you know, it's only been, it's been very few years uh, since a lot of the things that we see as the past um, have, uh, have passed since then. And so, you know, for me, I think that we really need to be looking at um, who is leading the movements as well. Um, you know, Prop 16 was led by a bunch of Black students from different schools and just like this entire like multicultural groups and look at who's working for them. Look at who's advocating for this. Look at who's behind this. Um, and then look at maybe the people who have these opposing views. Um, and, you know, there's a huge difference there in terms of who is fighting for Prop 16. And I think that that's who we need to be listening to. We need to be listening to those students, to their experiences. And also uh, the quota thing is not a thing. <laughs> it is, uh, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, there are strict uh, rules and laws against that. And that is not what Prop 16 will be doing. And so, you know, using that argument, I don't think is, uh, is very good either. Um, but that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. That was great. And I think you, you said it right. The Baki decision from the courts, as your Supreme Court has made it very clear, that quota is illegal. And that's not what um, affirmative faction is about. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes the other side is using false facts. And I think this is one of those situations where we need to clarify uh, that uh, clearly that wasn't what we were talking about. And Hiwat, uh, how about you? you have anything you would love to share with us too? Or what you think would be a good response to that? Yeah, absolutely, Otto. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would start out by saying that uh, neither ad is perfect uh, from a production perspective. Just kidding. Uh, I, I think <laughs> what stands out to me is that uh, they're both well-produced. I saw someone in the chat say they're, they're powerful, uh, and, I, and I agree. Uh, I think where I would I start to diverge is I think one acts in bad faith on a number of levels. Um, the first one, I think Alexis started off very well. Uh, color blindness and historiography. Uh, we have history and we have historiography and the way that we remember figures. Uh, and I think Obama is part of this, but MLK is the real subject uh, mm -hmm. in my view. Uh, it has been a long time since we have been blessed to have the uh, leadership in the flesh of a figure like MLK. I think in so many ways we are in a new uh, civil rights movement right now, uh, as we're seeing with demonstrations and uprisings, local community organizations like Mary's San Jose Strong Group, among many others, teaming up and saying, uh, we have a common agenda uh, for initiatives in the community that put us in a better position to succeed, put us in this case in a better position to be safe from brutal behavior from law enforcement that is out of line. Uh, and I think what we're seeing in the first advertisement is this advocacy of a society that is post-racial. Uh, the Republican Senate majority leader was quoted only a few weeks ago, Mitch McConnell as saying that, uh, what action need we take? We elected uh, Barack Obama as president. Uh, and and these are, are frightening things to hear uh, for people in social justice spaces, uh, but they're sentiments that are unfortunately being spread. Uh, sentiments that say and take the words of 
uh, we need to uh, eliminate uh, treatment based on race is not eliminate the ideation or the existence of racial considerations. Uh, and if folks have heard of Vox, V-O-X, they make some excellent videos. They made an excellent informative video about the history of affirmative action and the Supreme Court decision you cited, Otto, uh, in saying that, uh, and your background legally uh, invokes this just, just right, uh, quotas are not allowed. It, it, it rather, the consideration that is made in public education admissions uh, if there were to be considerations of race or of sex, uh, both of those being extremely important for representation in our public institutions. Uh, and that brings me to this idea that opponents of Proposition 16 or affirmative action uh, don't seem to be too alarmed about the discrimination that takes place in the private sector, uh, unfettered, unregulated in many cases, not only with pay and wages, but with hiring practices. I mean, there are laws that exist on a state level um, the Equal Rights Amendment is not something that has been passed. It remains in a, you know, sort of, uh, sort of stuck position. Uh, so we have an opportunity in California to remedy a lot of these ills. Um, the fact that uh, there are some signs that are invoked in the advertisement, which say the hidden agenda is quotas, which is based off of just uh, utter falsehood. Uh, and, and I think there's some perspective I could speak to as a student at a private school uh, is that the activism that uh, myself and my fellow students carry out is a lot different. We're advocating uh, for students who are on our campus on total full financial aid or a large percentage of financial aid uh, for more funds to be directed that, that way. Uh, we don't even have the ability to do activism on the part of admissions. Public universities have that luxury and we have the ability to advocate for the way that they think and the way that they operate. Uh, it's one of the great uh, uh, questions I've asked myself about going to a private school is we start um, from a position of activism so far behind. The private sector is so far behind what we have the chance to put into law. And that's what affirmative action really represents for me. Uh, and I think I would close by saying and asking the opponents of Prop 16, uh, where do they stand on eliminating legacy admissions? Uh, where do they stand on advocating for tuition free public colleges and universities? And where do they stand on additional funding for our middle schools and our high schools? Where do they stand on the Schools and Community First initiative? I think that was mentioned in the chat as well. Uh, this is a multifaceted fight. Alexis said, whether it passes or it doesn't, the fight is not over. Uh, but such an important element here in the way we look at admissions and employment. Absolutely. And I see uh, Professor Nikki, your hands is up. You would like to add something to the discussion? Yeah, uh, thank you. You know, as I'm as I'm listening to the, the, the debate and thinking about the, the the ad, what occurs to me is this that we need to change the narrative. We why are we fighting over crumbs? We're an extraordinarily wealthy society. When people say, Oh, there isn't enough room for so and so to get an education, oh, we don't have enough money to have a thousand Harvey Muds. What are we really saying? We're saying, oh, there's so much scarcity. But look around. There's so much money in this society. Huad made an important connection, and that is to the Prop 15 campaign. It's the very people who say, oh, we can't afford anything, who are now arguing against Prop 15. If we had Prop 15, We'd have billions more dollars to build UCs, to fund schools, to fund community colleges, to fund K-12. We need to quit arguing on their grounds. Like, oh, this is gonna hurt so-and-so, this is gonna hurt so-and-so. The argument that we need to be consistently making is that we all do better when we all do better and we can afford it. Let's quit fighting with each other. Let's just restructure the entire darn society to use the wealth of the society, the incredible wealth of the society, to benefit everybody. Nobody needs five jets. Like, quite seriously, after you have your first million bucks, you're probably good. You don't need a trillion. Just my thoughts. Thank you, Professor. Oh, that was a great uh, point. And uh, I'm going to actually open up uh, the uh, the floor. There's some questions. Uh, if there's any questions that's been uh, coming up, I would like to 
see if there's anything that we could, uh, uh, any, pan any question for panelists? Yes, um, Stegman W has a question. So I'm going to allow you to talk and you can ask your question directly instead of me reading it. Hi, my name is Wendy Stegman. Thank you for calling on me. Of course. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that people are clear about how really connected props 15 and 16 are. And, you know, it's, we need the money in the public schools and in the communities in order to provide for every child or every child who wants to being able to get their A to G requirements and having sufficient support. And I'd like to see, I understand that Prop 16 has been endorsed by a lot of groups, including the Board of Regents, but I'd like to see 15 and 16 kind of joined at the hip and let's get those kids from kindergarten or from preschool and get them ready and prepared and knowing that they can do it, knowing that they want to go to Harvey Mudd or wherever it is they want to go. So if there's any way to address that, if anyone has something to add to that, how do we go about getting them both through so that kids have this running start, all kids? Thank you, Ms. Stegman. Uh, any of our panelists would like to answer this question or comment? Oh, okay, Nikki, I see your hands up. Go ahead. I, I'll defer to somebody else. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> okay. I got ideas here, but anybody? All right, I'll give it a shot. Look, yeah. Alexis, 2.2, 2.3 million community college students in this state. Every single one of them will benefit from Prop 15 and Prop 16. Let's figure out how to turn out the young people in our society, how to turn them all into amazing organizers, building their communities, who educate, inspire, activate, mobilize voters to go and win. There's no reason we can't do that. You wanna work with me, you've got that SSCCC connection, you've got the Regents connection, let's turn on the student the youth vote, right? I'm, I'm, I got a faculty, that is dying to support students being empowered in that way, both as a union member and as a FAC leader statewide. Let's work, right? Let's, let's do it. Yes, I completely agree with that. And I know um, right now, I believe it is UCSA that is organizing with, um, I wanna say they're organizing with SSCCC um, and all the like CSSA, um, and they're trying to, you know, do a big get out the vote effort this year on multiple platforms, um, essentially like sending that out. But, um, you know, I definitely, I would love to work with you there. So um, <laughs> I'll definitely um, be getting you connected with them. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a part of their um, list of things that they want students to vote on, uh, Prop 15 is one of them. So um, I can definitely double check, make sure. So. Yes, go ahead, Mary. Um, I feel like in terms of talking about the packaging of Prop 15 and Prop 16 and the overlap and interconnection of the two of them, a lot of that will tie into um, the work that we're doing at San Jose Strong. Um, for those who are unfamiliar about what San Jose Strong is, um, it is an organization that, it's now an organization it started as me making a viral guide that went vi a guy that went viral on Instagram uh, two months ago, but now now it is an organization with over a dozen committees and like seven k followers. We have like a a big um, youth engagement in San Jose and South Bay, and we're very very excited for our upcoming website launch. Um, the vision of San Jose Strong is centralized information dissemination at a city scale. And so when you come onto our website and later on app, um, you can tap into all the organizations 
in the city, people can submit them and they'll be categorized so people can tap in. The vision is that like when you move to a city, you can get as plugged in as you want to. And that's something that is um, accessible to everyone. I hesitate about using the word accessible because I want to encompass disability justice with that word. But um, one big aspect of our upcoming platform is local government in which we have three committees. We have our voter guide committee, our policy committee, and our political landscape committee. And an example of what this will look like is in an upcoming election, if you're choosing between different councilmen, you'll see the two council members, you'll see the two of them lined up together and then you can see where they stand on different values. And then you're like, huh, well, what policy ties into that value? What, what's going on with that? If we're talking about equitable schools and resources, like what are, what are the things that we can vote on or that are being up on either the, the city level, the county level, the, the, the state level, um, country level that we can get engaged in? That's where you tap in to the policy committee's work. And then the political landscape is where you're like, what, what does the city council do? And like, what's their job? That's, that's their, their, they're the landscape of it. But, um, but we see all of that being packaged together in a way that is consumable for users within the digital space and that influencing ways in which the community can ga engage in a physical space as well when you're talking about reinventing cities. That's my personal passion as an engineer. Um, but on, on that scope, that's where I could see it being um, packaged together is a lot of that is in the marketing. And if you're talking about engaging with youth, I mean, I'm 21, right? You're talking about engaging with Gen Z. Like it's, it's really about how you can communicate with us on, on that digital landscape. Um, but beyond that, just, just, getting, just getting folks engaged at events or at different community gatherings where you might not be talking about it might not be centered, like this is centered on Prop 16, but if you're having any type of like affinity group and high school students that are coming out, right? Like it's reaching out to them and talking about this is how these two things matter to you guys and you guys should be engaged. And you can canvas two students through social media. They all have their Instagram pages for their high school groups, right? Um, and there are ways about plugging that as well. But those are some of, some of my, my thoughts to answer your question, but I will close to let more questions come in. Sure, absolutely. And Hawa, you got your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, just a quick, uh, I think, quick three action items. And I think, Wendy, you make an excellent point. Uh, if we've got two important initiatives tonight, we were spotlighting one, and, and it's come to our collective attention. And, and I think we all uh, have heard of 15, and, and I'm glad you spotlighted it. Uh, from a campaign perspective, I would say that three things are, are very doable. Uh, the first is to check out your own ballot that's coming up in November, ballotpedia.com or .org. Type in your zip code, see which candidates are on the ballot. Maybe you're here in our area and Otto's on your ballot, maybe others are. Uh, see where they stand on it. Uh, if it's not available on their website, you don't see anything on social media, reach out, uh, call or text to the office and use that. Honestly, uh, people talk about a litmus test. I would use it as a litmus test when I vote and I, and I will. Uh, where do you stand on these two key propositions? That tells me a lot about you uh, and what you intend to do and what your values are. Uh, two would be to create an email and text template for your outreach. Uh, you know, I'm sure, uh, very well why you're supportive of 15 and 16 as we all do for our own uh, unique reasons. Uh, type up once why, what all those reasons are and use that uh, to send 20 texts, uh, 50 emails. Uh, it goes a long way and, and tell folks to do the same. Uh, and, and the final is host an event like this. Uh, Zoom is easy to use, Google Meet is easy to use, uh, uh, group FaceTime, whatever it might be, uh, and then invite your own network uh, and say, uh, I'll talk a little bit and then you share your experiences as well. And uh, we'll all come out as organizers from that one meeting. I think that's where it starts. So thanks for your question. No, th thank you very much Watt, for uh, addressing that. Um, and uh, I think there's another questions there uh, from the audience. I would like to go ahead and uh, ask uh, Elka, do you want to go ahead and read the questions? Sure. Well, Gina Gates thinks that you guys are all too nice and you should call out the uh, anti Prop 16 people as fake. So, um, 
but we'll go on to this next question. Okay, this is from Leslie Nassen King. Um, I fully support Prop 16. Without quotas, how do employers and schools provide full inclusion of all underrepresented people of color? What is the mechanism of Prop 16? Okay, that's a great question. To dispel the reason why quota is really not the right way to go and we have other ways to do this. Go ahead, Alexis, I saw your hands go up. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Um, so just as a little disclaimer, uh, the University of California has not figured out what they're going to do, um, like a plan or anything. So it's not coming from that. Um, they cannot plan out for something that is not uh, in writing yet, like, you know, um, in law. Um, so, um, but as for what I think would happen, at least. Um, so one thing is that when we're looking at, I mean, I can really just speak for the most part on um, admissions, right, in colleges, but within admissions, a part of that is, you know, you cannot see the person's race um, or gender in a college application. So you're looking at it, you're just reading the essay. If they happen to mention it in the essay, that is a workaround, right? Um, and that's how you kind of know more about their background and that kind of thing. But other than that, it doesn't show. Um, in this case, it would show. And even though that doesn't seem like a huge change, um, it absolutely makes a difference because then you can see, you know, not only did this person grow up in poverty and went to a low under-resourced uh, high school, that kind of thing, you're also seeing that that student maybe is Black or maybe that student grew up on a reservation and they were Native, right? Um, you're seeing this different side of them that completely goes into the narrative of who they are. Um, whereas right now you can't see that. Um, and so that's one thing is that, you know, that's how it would change. And I mean, just looking at how that simple change can change admissions so much, right? Like back when, you know, before we had Prop 209 implemented that those higher rates of diversity that suddenly just plummeted, all of that was due to just not being able to see race on an application, uh, which is really telling uh, to me. And other things just to note, um, for example, we, you know, we can't do, um, I work for the Native American Student Development Center on campus. Uh, I do a lot of outreach as much as I can. That is a lot of outreach you cannot do. Um, you know, we can't go and table at most uh, high school events and things like that. Um, that's not allowed under Prop 2 and And so things like that can be a problem. Um, and then, you know, student groups also cannot um, do that. They have a lot less power. Um, you know, there's problems with, I know, for example, um, one example that was brought up during the Prop 16 uh, kind of opening event was how, you know, for example, um, Asian Americans who were business owners that faced discrimination uh, during the time that COVID broke out, for example, um, you, you weren't able to create a specific grant that was for Asian Americans that dealt with hate crimes. You can't do that under Prop 29. Right? And so it's these little things that uh, Prop 29 does to really restrict us. Um, but, you know, mostly that's, that's what would be happening was we're not using quotas, we're just incorporating it into someone's story to figure out who they are. And that's really all it is. So. Like the totality as a whole, and this just a couple of factors, whether it's gender, or it's race, it's only two of many factors that we look in the total uh, package of the uh, applicants, right? And that's what uh, makes this so uh, uh, important uh, for full understanding. Um, and I think I do have one last question that was, uh, I see, and I think it's a very important question to answer, is uh, how will the affirmative action uh, affect the Asian Americans in the uh, college uh, admission process? Uh, and uh, I think it's a fair question, and I think there's a lot of debate of what, how negative that would hurt Asian Americans versus maybe positive for Asian Americans. Anybody would like to uh, uh, tackle that question? Go ahead, Alexis. Sorry, I don't want to be uh, talking too much. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, as I will only say as much as I know, right? Um, but one huge thing that I learned, especially when I was actually on the Board of Governors for the California Community Colleges, yeah. um, you know, I was able to attend a few of the um, Asian American Caucus uh, meetings for um, the CEOs and also some faculty and that kind of thing. Um, and I never realized how important uh, disaggregated data is, which essentially just looks at, you know, when you're looking at, for example, this huge kind of bucket of Asian American, right, all the different ethnicities within that, um, the cultures within that, right. So, for example, near me um, in Merced is the uh, 
Hmong uh, population, right? Where there's a lot of Hmong people. And when you look at that data and you actually look at it by ethnicity and not just as Asian Americans as a whole, um, you notice that there are maybe certain uh, ethnicities within Asian American, um, I don't remember which ones exactly, but those ones typically do very, very well. And, you know, because we're looking at, um, you know, a kind of uh, mean or, you know, um, this kind of average, uh, it tips them toward the high scale. But when you actually look at these other ethnicities within Asian American, you'll notice that a majority of those ethnicities uh, are actually um, a lot more in line with, for example, um, you know, Black Americans and, uh, you know, Hispanic Americans, that kind of thing. The the numbers that we're more used to seeing. Um, and so just because we see this kind of uh, stereotype of uh, Asian Americans being really well off and like, you know, they're like very big within. The more, the more than more <laughs> Yes. And so when you, when you look at the actual, when you look at it all separately, um, you'll see that those uh, other ethnicities within Asian American are, are not faring as well. And so really that's why we're saying it would help everyone is it would help all of those people who are not um, on the top end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that really helped clear, clear that up for me um, and show me that, you know, there's a lot of complexity within being Asian American. It's not just, you know, you're this one ethnicity. So. Um, Thank you, Alexis. Yeah, that was great. Uh, and what? I see your hands up. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Alyssa, for the question. Uh, again, I, I think one thing I could add to what I mentioned at the beginning of, of the panel as an Afghan American, and Otto, to be clear, uh, by first generation, I mean born here. Uh, so my parents are both uh, immigrants from Afghanistan. I, you know, here at West San Jose, Santa Clara, uh, here, here in the South Bay. Um, but what I can say from that uh, identity and background is that I come from an interesting uh, place of, I don't know if it's fusion or if it's just a place of isolation in the discussion about uh, race. Uh, there's a certain argument for me to classify myself as white. Uh, there's an argument for uh, Asian American in the sense that uh, the country that my parents came from is in Central Asia. I, I could identify uh, you know, uh, folks talk about the need for a category for Middle Easterns or a category for Iranians specifically. Uh, and, and I think it's a, an important discussion that needs to happen. Uh, and I think Alexis made a great answer to the question when, when they talked about the fact that uh, tendencies, statistics, data about economic prosperity and other metrics of prosperity within the East Asian community uh, in addition to the South Asian community, talking about Indian Americans, Pakistani, Afghan, um, going uh, from many places which uh, immigrants to this country hail from, uh, no policy is, I, I think, ever going to be able to ameliorate every individual community's needs. And what we need to do as a result of that uh, is think about uh, how can we, and, and the folks talk a lot about uh, leveling the playing field and, and I think that what that phrase fails to acknowledge is that this is a corrective measure, uh, but it's a measure that we need. It's not something like we're going to be generous and we're going to uh, let people have a better chance. It's actually a much more necessary than that. It should be given a lot more merit than just simply saying we're going to do this to make it easier for some people, because that's really not the case uh, in my view. And I think uh, th the way I look at it from research that I've done and thinking about the Harvard University lawsuit that happened either in 2018 or 19, where a lot of organizations, typically those who you'd expect to be against affirmative action, teamed up and accused Harvard University of discriminating against Asian Americans. Uh, and a lot of the evidence that was used and the data that was used uh, didn't turn out to be true in the sense that uh, Harvard's discrimination was not provable because of year by year, the uh, magnitude or the percentage of the campus, which was Asian American, was fluctuating. Uh, they used a holistic score, which did take race into account, and they are a private university. So, you know, they're not affected. They can do what they want to, going back to an earlier point I made. Uh, but it shows that even with a private university who takes race into consideration, that level of Asian Americans on paper, on, you know, the numbers that we're looking at, it's still not what opponents of affirmative action say it's going to be. And when we pass Prop 16 in November, that still won't be the case. We'll have diversity. Uh, and we'll have opportunity for everybody 
uh, from a quite a utilitarian view in my view and in, in my understanding. Thank you, Hiwat. Um, anybody else? Um, yeah, I think we've been able to address all the questions from the from the audience. So that was great. Thank you for the panelists for all your uh, your uh, wonderful perspective. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and turn over to talk about what the next step is going to be. And uh, Lawrence, go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to wait for the screen to pop up. There we are. Next steps. So, so what do we do with all the information that we've just learned today uh, from our great panelists um, and also from the audience questions that really expanded this discussion? And there are really kind of two ways that we could offer up to folks who are here and those who are watching uh, this recording after the event. First of all, join the campaign. Join the campaign for Prop 16. Uh, you can actually go into the website and you want to go to vote yes on prop16.com and that's the main statewide campaign uh, for California. On there you can find opportunities on how to volunteer. Uh, now obviously because of the COVID situation it's very unlikely that they'll be doing canvassing so you can contribute in other ways whether it be through text banking, phone banking, or even just donations of however much you can. A more grassroots way in terms of locally, San Jose Strong. Um, I believe Mary, Mary Celeste, the founder of uh, San Jose Strong, has talked a little bit more about the organization, how you can definitely get involved. And this is their website uh, on the screen too. They'll be rolling out a new website, a lot more information. And I'm gonna just go ahead and let Mary talk a little bit more about San Jose Strong. Yeah, um, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, a little bit about San Jose Strong. Um, it's, uh, we, we subscribe ourselves as a grassroots organization to reinvent San Jose for and by the community. And what we see our online platform doing is being a space where, you know, you see platforms like Visit San Jose as the spark notes for tourists. We would like to be the whole book for residents. So if you live in San Jose and South Bay, you can come to our platform and find ways to get tapped in to your community. Um, a lot, I have a lot of qualms with the way our cities are set up and designed, um, whether we're talking about an environmental perspective on the physical infrastructure or a social perspective in terms of the ability for community to be formed on a city scale. And I see San Jose Strong as the technological blueprint to help empower communities to make informed, actionable decisions while uniting um, amongst uh, ourselves to empower each other and to utilize the skills of our vibrant and diverse community. And so um, right now on our website, it redirects to our card.co, which is just like our, our like free platform. So we have like our surveys um, where you can submit like a research inquiry, you can submit events that you're hosting, you can submit your organization or business, um, you can submit a call to action or a call for support. Um, and we have internal pro protocol that I've documented to address all of those ev events and organizations are currently being updated on a spreadsheet by some really awesome volunteers who check the submissions every day. Um, but in our upcoming website with our programming team, um, that'll be automatically um, updated after a vetting process um, to our website, which has like mapping. So you can just click on the map very similar, like if you were to merge aspects of like social media to like Google Maps to like libraries, that's kind of like where we're coming at it. Um, we have, I think we have 17 committees. Yes, we have a lot of committees and we have, <laughs> we have like 50 to 100 active volunteers. We, it's 100% volunteer base um, from San Jose and South Bay. Um, doing some really awesome work. Our social media, we promote and support um, ongoing efforts in the community. We're pretty focused on making sure any decisions or actions are directly done by the advice and input of those directly affected so that it is meeting their needs. We also are big proponents on building off of the legwork that has already been done by decades, centuries of organizers and activists and just community members in San Jose and globally um, before us. And we're not reinventing a wheel in any particular <laughs> um, way. But yeah, we have awesome committees um, doing work in transportation, homelessness and housing, public education, music and arts. We hosted the San Jose Fan Fest, um, which was a 
music live stream festival showcasing all black musicians. We had an online art auction, raising money for raising the bar, a black led initiative, um, supporting foster care youth. Um, and that was a really awesome event that I think showcases the, the sense of community that we're building. But yeah, you can tap into San Jose Strong. Um, we, on our socials, we promote a lot of calls to action to get engaged with easy steps to plug in deeper. Um, I'm also happy to talk more to anybody who wants to. If you go on our website, there's our like email um, and our socials. I will likely be the person responding <laughs> if you message. So if you're like, hello, you were talking on that panel, I'll be like, yes, what do you want to talk about? So yeah, that's a little bit about that. I'll pass it back to Lawrence. Um, let him carry it on. Thank you so much. Also, again, thank you so much for letting me be here. And Absolutely. No, thank you for coming. And also to all the panelists. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to a closing by uh, our host, Otto Lee. Hey, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. It was really amazing on the Friday night to have all of you uh, speaking with us on a very important topic. Uh, we had the opportunity to discuss why affirmative action is still very much needed to provide equal opportunity to everyone to address the race inequity and how this issue could be sometimes misused as a wedge between the different ethnic communities. Affirmative action is not quota. Affirmative action is not discrimination against the whites or Asians, but it is providing help to those marginalized in our society who might not have the financial resources, and including women and girls, to provide a better chance to succeed in our California public colleges or provide everybody the opportunity to get a better job or bid on some of the large public work projects, which is now very much skewered uh, to non-ethnic minorities. Uh, quoting the, one of the speaker here today, uh, Martin Luther King, his own writing on his book, Why We Can't Wait, back in 1964, he actually said that on the surface, this appears reasonable. We talk about the Prop 2 and 9 type arguments, but it is not realistic. A society that has done something special against the Negro at the time for hundreds of years must now do something special for the Negro. So basically, it's very clear that supporting a perfect action is something that Dr. King has strongly supported back in 1964. And I'm sure you could get many of such similar echoes from President Obama as well. Let's get the facts straight. Let's get everybody educated and let's get out the vote. Uh, this is going to be a very important election, November 3rd on Prop 15, right, so that we could get the uh, split road to get uh, the property tax that we needed uh, to raise billions of dollars for California and also Prop 6 in the past for equality to everybody. Thank you very much for being here tonight and it's truly an honor to moderate this excellent panel tonight. And I am Otto Lee. Thank you very much for coming. Good night. <laughs>